Hello and welcome to this week's program of the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Each week we connect with and hear from fascinating and inspirational speakers, often with a message focused on our interests in innovation, entrepreneurship, and education. As a Rotary Club, we look for ways these programs might foster new um, approaches to improving communities near and far. We're glad you've joined us and I hope you'll enjoy how we are exploring new, how technology can serve the business of service to others. I'll now turn it over to Rush and Hurley who will introduce this week's speaker. Hello everybody, thank you for joining us again this week. Uh, we are very excited to have with us uh, Lisa Blanchard. Uh, she came to us actually one of the very best ways we can get speakers, which is one of our members uh, heard her speak somewhere else and was like, oh my God, this is a story that needs to be shared. Uh, and so, so we're very happy to have her. Lisa has started a program called the Grateful Garment Program that you read a little bit about in the intro uh, before, the, uh, before you clicked on our, our YouTube link here. Uh, and we're excited to hear the, the details of how she got going with this and uh, the vision she has for helping those who are in very, very difficult circumstances. So Lisa, with that, we very happily hand it over to you. Good morning, one and all. This is exciting to be a part of um, technology and works and spreading the message and having community. That's um, pretty exciting to me. I am the founder and executive director of the Grateful Garment Project. And um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. There, is that working? Okay. So, the Grateful Garment Project is in the business of returning dignity. We return dignity to those who've had it stolen through some form of sexual violence. Unfortunately, sexual violence is rampant in our community. Hold on one second, my slide, there we go. Um, it's rampant in our community. In America, as you can see, sexual violence takes place about every minute and a half. Um, and uh, many times these victims are children. Sexual violence has no dividing line. There's no sex, there's no socioeconomic dividing line or gender or age, um, faith, tradition, e ethnicity, anything. And so pretty much everybody's eligible, unfortunately. And what happens when people are sexually assaulted and elect to report that assault um, is, is unfortunate. Basically, what happens is if somebody reports an assault or some form of sexual violence and they seek law enforcement or medical attention, they're offered the opportunity to undergo the forensic exam we know of as a rape kit, right? And so when somebody goes through this process of having a rape kit done, it's, um, it's not a warm, fuzzy thing to begin with. It uh, can take a, a minimum of three and a half hours to complete. And it's a clean room exam. They basically open up a sheet and you undress on the sheet. And as a part of that process, they ask you to surrender all your clothes you're wearing for evidence. So if you give up all that you're wearing, what there's nothing to wear home. What are you going to wear home? And so what we do is uh, we establish clothing closets at the exams where people, at the places where people go and have these exams. We establish these clothing closets uh, with clothing between the age of two, three-year-old toddler to four, five, ex adult. So no matter what shape, size, gender you are, they're always brand new clothes for people to wear home. Um, it's really our vision and purpose and mission to make sure that no victim of sexual violence ever uh, experiences further results as, as a result of lack of resources. Um, we think it's horrific that these people have nothing to wear home. And if there are no clothes available, many times they'll do things like offer hospital gowns or, you know, the nurses or doctors were actually providing clothes out of their own pocket, just like teachers would provide school supplies. And that's not sustainable. So we um, establish these clothing closets all over California. We currently work in 29 counties with over 70 agencies. 
Last year, Grateful Garment Project distributed over 32,900 items. An item might be um, a t-shirt, a um, pair of sweatpants, a sweatshirt, underwear, bras, all types of things that people would need to wear, to wear home. I mean, if, if you think about it, if you had unfortunately been a victim of some form of sexual violence, what would you want to wear home, right? And how valuable would something like a toothbrush be in that circumstance? And um, so it's just those little tiny basic dignities that are essential. Also, along the way, that, that program, we call it our resource closet, that's our core program, that was the basis on which we were founded. And actually, um, the Grateful Garment Project started as a class project for my undergraduate. It was never, ever the plan to start a nonprofit organization. I was just trying to graduate. Um, and, and I started this project and it just went viral. And we've been around for six, going on seven years. And uh, right now, anywhere between um, 70 to 72% of the state of California's population has access to Grateful Garment Projects resources. Um, it's hugely significant. And I really had no idea the vein of need that I was hitting just trying to graduate. So we have six programs. The first one is the resource closet, which is the one I've talked to you about. But along the way, other programs grew and they came about as a result or a need. Um, for example, what if somebody is being assaulted at home? What if the sexual violation is happening at home and home is not safe? Then what ends up happening is they um, are taken to a safe house or a shelter or they're in foster care. And as a result of that, um, they need more than one set of clothes to get them home. They're gonna need resources for a few days. And so we started programs to address that. We started a program where we work with law enforcement. The packet forward is working with law enforcement. When they go in and they do raids and they rescue people from human sexual trafficking, um, programs or commercially sexually exploited children, CSET, children that are being, that are being pimped out. Um, we provide them with backpacks filled with resources so that they can go into those situations and immediately provide resources to people that are probably being held naked or almost naked, right? Um, we work a lot with the human sexual trafficking and commercially sexually exploited children. You can see that acronym, CSET, um, agencies and shelters. Um, we have the program Dress for Dignity where we help um, people that are finally gonna get their day in court with uh, acquiring court appropriate clothing so that they can go into court and face their perpetrator for probably the first time since the event happened with dignity and with credibility on uh, from a court perspective um, we have the youth incentive program which incentivizes young people to return for follow-up medical appointments you see once you're 12 years old in california and probably beyond california but i can only speak to california um, you're in charge of your physical body as far as your reproductive health you can seek uh, birth control, terminations, all that type of stuff. You can also have a rape kit done, and you can have it done without parental consent or knowledge. So what ends up happening is you get 15-year-olds that have been assaulted that go to the hospital to get help and treatment, and then the hospital and the law enforcement agencies cannot tell their parents what has happened without the written consent of these young people. So the likelihood of those young people returning for any follow-up medical appointments or uh, a second round of STD testing or any counseling is very slim. And so we incentivize young people to return for these types of appointments because it's crucial and essential that they do. Young people that are sexually assaulted are seven times more likely to not graduate from high school, they're three times more likely to be a victim of violence later in life, they're twice as likely to be sexually assaulted again. 
Uh, and that doesn't include things like drug addiction, alcohol, mental illness, suicide, uh, self-harm, um, all different types. And so it's really important that these young people come back. And so the incentive is a $5 gift card. You know, they'll come back for a $5 Starbucks card. Um, I could spend an hour telling you about our different programs, um, and I'd be glad to answer any questions or respond to any emails, but I'm going to move on in the sake of time. So one of our greatest needs in all the different resources that we provide are bras, and we have um, started a drive called Operation Embrace in this year to really uh, address that need. You know, we may have a clothing drive or raise money out there in the world, and um, we may get 100 sweatshirts and, you know, 150 t-shirts and 200 pairs of socks or, or even in smaller numbers. But even with all that, we'll get like one or two bras. And um, that's really problematic because people that are victims of, females that are victims of sexual violence, anybody, there's this huge sensation of, shame like it's one of the few crimes out there where the victim thinks what have i done to to create this right and so the idea for most females of going out not wearing a, a bra is uh perpetuates that feeling of shame like my, i was raised by a good southern mother who said you don't go outside properly spandexed and wrapped and and uh, and all the appropriate things for females um, but also, if you're injured, if your injury is in that region, um, being without support is actually painful. And having a sports bra with the additional support is really beneficial to that process. So we're trying to raise 20,000 bras. Um, I just explained why bras and why sports bras, because it's kind of a, it's, we don't have to worry about the cup size and all that type of stuff. Um, so there's a website for that, Join Operation Embrace, if you're interested. You can also visit the Grateful Garment website, which we'll share with you at the end of this presentation. Um, if anybody has access to lots of bras, please let us know. Um, impact. We are impact. You know, on any given day, the resources of Grateful Garment Project provide help anywhere between 25 to 50 people every single day. It's just... It just, unfortunately, uh, just never stops or slows down. And so it's, it's imperative. We do this huge thing every day, and most people don't even know we exist. You know, we kind of laugh. Our marketing campaign exists um, is where two or more gather, Lisa talks, you know. <laughs> That's it. So we have a hope for the future. Our hope is that, you know, we live in this great nation, but we're also in this amazing state that has uh, has the capacity greater than many countries in the world. And the idea that people will go home in hospital gowns today just is unacceptable to me. And it's my hope that it's unacceptable to you guys. Um, our hope is that anywhere inside or outside California one day, we can be there to provide the resources needed so that these people have basic dignity after somebody has stolen it from them through an act of sexual violence. So how can somebody help? You know, I better than anyone understand how crucial it is or how much one person can make a difference. You know, one simple class project helps all these people. One person standing up and saying, this is not okay, makes a difference so people can get involved they can make donations they can uh, donate new clothing and goods they can volunteer we are a primarily a volunteer run organization i am the only full-time employee and we have three part-time people and most of the work is carried out by volunteers they can host a gathering for garments, which is a micro fundraiser, and I'd be glad to share that information with you guys. They could organize a drive, you know, with your group, your club, your job, uh, with anybody, your friends. Um, pretty much, you could turn any direction a grateful garment and throw a stone and make a difference. Um, and a lot of these volunteer type things people can do, they can do them virtually. They don't even have to come to our brick and mortar. They can do it online. 
So what difference do dollars make? You know, I, I, in any business, you know, money, money is the thing, you know, and some people don't like to talk about money, but money really does a lot of great things. A dollar can provide something for people to eat or socks to wear. And I mean, I think this graphic does a good job explaining how a very small amount can do a great thing. And then finally, join us. Join us in the process of returning dignity to people who have had it um, stolen through some form of sexual abuse. Visit our website, like us on Facebook, tell your friends and family, talk about the subject, but not only talk about it, but, but also take a, a further action and encourage other people to take action. Because Me Too is fabulous, but you know, hashtag Me Too, act now, right? Because standing up and saying, this is happening to me is a great start and we can do so much more. And it's my hope that um, people join us, those that have been touched by sexual violence and those that have not, because it's not okay to live in a world where sexual violence runs rampant. And um, here's, the, here's the great visual, you know, do you wanna send people home in a hospital gown or a sweatsuit? And uh, so please join us in returning dignity to those who've had it stolen through sexual violence. Thank you very much. So I'm going to stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Any questions? So Rustin, I think, would you like to lead off with a question? Love to, love to. Um, th Lisa, this is such a powerful project. I love that it came out of your, like, like an undergraduate, you know, class project where you were like, oh, this would be a good idea. Um, having worked in a lot of uh, schools uh, and, and seeing the different things that are, are typically in place in order to help uh, kids at school, I can, I can imagine a kid deciding, for example, you know, after, after a horrible experience to go to, to go to someone at school because you know, they, they may feel embarrassed to talk to their parents or something like this. Have you done a lot of projects with schools so far? We have, uh, you know, in the from the very beginning, being that this started as a college campus, uh, as a college project, I felt it was really important to work with schools. Um, we, uh, we first started working with the college levels because, you know, the reality is sexual violence takes place in all ages. But the more prevalent ages are the kind of what we call the student ages, you know, like that 12 to 24 year old, that's where the, the greater risk takes place. And um, so we have worked with some junior colleges and some universities doing drives, doing awareness uh, events, talking with people. Um, I found that the more traditional, uh, you know, junior high and high school uh, organizations, I've had a little more challenge getting in there. And I'm sure I'm not the only person knocking at their door, but also they have more hoops to jump through. Hmm. So when they are willing to work with us, we definitely do. We also offer internships uh, for high school and college age students. And we encourage them to get involved because um, we need to train the future advocates, right? And we need to, uh, what I know is that sexual violence, just like domestic violence, just like racism, it's a learned behavior. So we have to teach something different, right? And the best way to teach is by doing, right? And so I'm hoping that we can uh, create a new world by, by giving it another option. Well, there, there are lots of high school programs, interact programs through Rotary and, and, and other mm -hmm. service clubs, key clubs, things like this that, that you know, I, th I would think would be wonderful for connecting and understanding, you know, kind of what you're doing and mm -hmm. hopefully even channeling people into your internship programs. That's fantastic. Yes. Yes. Other questions? Monique, sure. did you I'll, have yeah, I'll ask a question. Um, so it looks like, it appears that you have... Um, in social media, a Facebook page and a, a Instagram feed. Um, mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I, I'm not the social media wizard. So I think we have uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, and we have LinkedIn. And I think there's something else. 
forgive me for not. No, that's fine. Um, I'm wondering if, um, you know, if, if I were to, when this goes onto the, the club site to, you know, I want to direct my friends to let them know that, that this exists, but I didn't know if I should point to your, your Facebook page or just your, your basic homepage, how, you know, what, uh, you, you said your marketing plan is you talking to people, which is, which is great because I think word of mouth really is um, a good way of doing that. I just want to know, um, you know, as somebody who thinks that this is such a great idea, um, where, what is the best point for people to learn more about you, learn more what, about what your needs are um, and how they can help? So that's a great question, and I feel like it's a multi-part response. So the first thing is, uh, whatever people are most uh, comfortable with, everybody has their thing. I know people that don't use Facebook at all, they just use Instagram, or they just use Twitter. Twitter was the other one, right? Uh -huh. um, and so first of all, it's whatever, whatever basis on which they feel comfortable. Um, if you go to the website, you're going to get more information about the history, the mission, mm -hmm. uh, our programs, uh, you know, their information about volunteering, that kind of stuff is on there. But if you're looking for more like on a day-to-day -day or kind of, uh, you know, what's the greatest, latest need or what's trending now or what's hot in out there, um, then going to our Facebook page or Instagram would definitely be it. We also have a newsletter. You can um, go to our website and subscribe for our newsletter, and that'll kind of keep people abreast of what's going on too. So, okay. you know, did, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you very okay. much. <laughs> um, and my question has, I have many questions, but I'll <laughs> keep it to one or maybe two, <laughs> um, which is, are you doing, I realize in a small organization, you cannot be everywhere every minute, but um, I have been hearing about some successes in local Rotary Clubs at using crowdfunding to raise really quite large amounts of money. I mean, of course, you always hear about the ones that are the face of that organization mm -hmm. is some Hollywood star, but um, I'm thinking, well, I know of one club in our district that raised $64,000 in a Kickstarter or GoFundMe campaign, and I will be finding out what they're doing. <laughs> because we are all about, uh, every Rotary Club it has some fundraising effort going or multiple fundraising efforts going. Mm -hmm. and I would think that this might be something that would be a resource for you as well. Um, we did, when crowdfunding first came out, we did a crowdfunding campaign. We were an even smaller organization. M remember, we're, we're six years old, and May will be seven, right? And when we did the crowdfunding, I think it was like two, maybe three years ago, we were a smaller organization. What I discovered about crowdfunding is it's really about your audience, right? So you can start a crowdfunding campaign, but if you don't have a way to get it out to people, then then nobody's seeing it, right? It's right. Like a, it's like a, opening a, a store and not announcing it, right? And so um, we haven't done it in a while, but it would not be a bad idea to consider doing. If, uh, if your group would be interested in helping us do that, that would be even... Um, more fantastic because as you pointed we, out we can't be everywhere all at once so uh you're hired <laughs> you're hired welcome aboard <laughs> well i can't say that i know much about it at this point but but, but you're I, willing <laughs> <laughs> well what i have observed is that crowd crowdfunding efforts um seem to be more successful as time goes on and i think it's because more people are aware that they can go Go to GoFundMe, for example, find in something that they relate to and give money to it. And I think that's happening more and more, whereas probably at the time of your early efforts, it just wasn't as well known. And there are beginning to be a lot more platforms for that. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm happy to share whatever I can learn about this because I know a lot less than you do. 
Well, maybe we want to do a GoFundMe for Operation Embrace. You know, that's a brilliant idea. Thank you for that idea. I'm writing it yeah, down. Yeah, I, I think that would be a really popular, um, specific, targeted campaign. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I hadn't been aware of Weave before um, the last few days, and I heard today on the radio, in fact, that Weave was distributing um, information at the at the Capitol, the state Capitol, to staffers and legislators talking about sexual harassment at work and things like that and mm -hmm. what resources are available to them. And, um, you know, and I'm hoping that they're connecting people who need help to or are interested in helping to you. So I don't know if you want to reach out to them again and and perhaps, um, you know, it's really funny because just yesterday I got an email from Unrelated. Uh, somebody gave me a list of local politicians that are that are interested in sexual violence, and mm -hmm. that I should uh, get together with them, set up appointments. They sent you actually even sent me the links on how to set up appointments with them. It's a good idea. It's interesting that you brought that up. So one one of the things that impresses me most about the work you're doing is the the ease for people to get involved, right? The idea of host, you know, just say, hey, everybody, we're going to have a get together, you know, this weekend and bring some clothes because we're going to donate it to this thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's incredibly easy to do. And anybody could stop and go, you know, I can do that, right? And, and at the same time they do something like that, it would be so easy to be able to say, by the way, this organization, they're doing this thing, you know, Operation Embrace. And, and you, you know, the, the, the overlap between, between the multiple efforts really fits well it seems like it's, it's a it's a real template for a lot of good co you know good organizations to follow in terms of simplify how people can get involved you seem to have done that very well well thank you thank you for that uh that's nice to know and hear we actually have a whole template for the gathering for garment process we try to make it as turnkey as possible so that people can just have a party you know like these micro fundraisers don't have to be very they're not a big deal you can uh, i've had them people barbecue you know and that they have a barbecue and invite people to bring stuff i've had people serve cake and coffee and and then i've had people micro brew their own beer and fly in pizzas from chicago right you know <laughs> people have had bands they've just done all kinds of things you've had people that are just having jam sessions and they've turned it into them and the reality is it's a fun event more times than not but also it tends to be more intimate you know sexual violence is a uh is a can be an icky subject for a lot of people. The word rape has such a charge to it, right? And and the reality is by the time women are my age, three out of four of them have been sexually violated. When, when By the time men are my age, one half of them have been sexually violated in their lifetime. So pretty much if somebody is not a victim of sexual violence or, har violence or harassment, then they know somebody, okay, that is. And so, um, since it touches so many people's lives, many people don't necessarily want to talk about it. If if they talk about it, they uh, might feel the need to finally, you know, resolve it within themselves. Having a small, safe group to talk about a subject that has a charge really makes it easier for people. I cannot tell you how many times over the years uh, that I've, I've been speaking or we've been doing gathering for garments, which by the way, we will come to and make a presentation and participate if you want us to. And somebody has come up to me and said, you know, this happened to me. This happened to me and I've never told anyone. You're the first person I've ever told, right? Um, or it happened to me when I was young and nobody believed me, right? And, um, and so, Perhaps just attending a party is the first thing that the people are doing towards their healing. Or maybe it's a healing process because they're taking a step towards helping others, which allow them to help themselves. So in so many ways, beyond the simplicity of the capacity for people to get involved, it can also have a real effect in people uh, moving forward in their lives emotionally and spiritually. Wow, thank you. So Rustin and Monique, do either of you have any other questions? 
So I I'd like to backtrack just a moment and make some introductions, which I should have done before we got into the question and answer period. But um, to I'm not quite sure where they're going to appear on your screen, but the, the lone male here is Rustin Hurley, who is our founding president of our e-club, which is in its third, third year now, Rustin. <laughs> And Monique Z, um, who has been a member for longer than I have. I joined in July after belonging to the Rotary Club Cupertino for about 10 years. And by the way, I would be interested in sharing that, you know, that we had you present to us um, because they are always looking for good speakers. And this topic is, I think, so timely in the age of hash sign me too, <laughs> um, that it's, I thought it was really a good thing to have you at this moment. Um, so if there are no other questions, we'll move on to the closing of the program. Um, so we would like to encourage all who've enjoyed the program to let us know what you think. Um, below, you will find our Discuss, D-I-S-Q-U-S -S, tool for sharing and responding uh, to comments. Please take a moment to add to the conversation. And we encourage you, Lisa, um, to kind of watch in the week in which we air this, uh, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about that a little later. And feel free to respond to those who have made comments because they always like to know that you heard um, from them. I'd be delighted. <laughs> Great. Um, members and Rotarian guests, make sure that you fill out the attendance section too. It helps us to know about the reach of our efforts and also serves um, as a makeup for a missed meeting. If you put your email address properly below, you'll get a message um, that you can pass along to your club secretary if you are a visiting Rotarian. Um, and as always, we like to give the final word to our speaker. So Lisa, take it away. I just want to thank you so much for this opportunity to come and speak to you guys. And I'm hoping that in your hearts and minds that you too will join us in returning dignity to those who've had it stolen through some form of sexual violence. Hashtag me too, take action. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.